Tom is uh, watching and listening this morning, but if he is, it should have rained like this last week when he was preaching. Because the text that he had was a very sad text where Jeremiah just weeps. Um, he is known as the weeping prophet. I shared with you that one of my primary sources for this series on Jeremiah, uh, every time I preach these texts, uh, is a book by uh, Bill Peterson uh, called uh, Jeremiah the Prophet Who Wouldn't Quit. Uh, there are times when he's the prophet who wouldn't quit weeping. And um, it's very difficult, as I said, to figure out the chronology of all of this, but as, get, as best we can put it together, that time of weeping that Tom preached about last week, um, when he just comes out and says, I is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there any Ben Gay around here? For my aching heart is what he's saying, some salve for me, and uh, can you smell it? Can you remember when we were kids when Ben Gay was the, the common uh, analgesic? Uh, you know, every locker room in the world smelled like that, and uh, uh, it just reminded you of aching because you would rub that stuff on. I, we didn't have a whole lot of trainers and equipment back then if you were an athlete. All you had was the ointment, and uh, our football team uh, purchased a, uh, uh, a whirlpool and uh, that, that was to be uh, the new salve for everything. Whatever it was, stick it in the whirlpool. You got a head injury, stick it in the whirlpool. Uh, we bought this thing at Cures All. You know, we went from Ben Gay to the whirlpool, but uh, that's basically what Jeremiah finally says, is there no bomb? Of course, Gilead was the area from which they harvested it, that gum that came uh, from that land that produced that salve that was soothing for the physical body. But uh, Jeremiah's spirit was hurting so badly. Originally, he preached in his hometown of Anathoth, a town of mostly disenfranchised priests. You know, they weren't working, and, and it was a town to which the priest, the high priest uh, who deserted David for Absalom was banished by Solomon. So, you know, that town had a, a great history. Uh, and uh, God calls him to preach to them first, and uh, they responded by wanting to kill him. No wonder he was weeping. And then the Lord tells him, uh, I command you to never get married. Remember Hosea? I command you to marry Gomer, the prostitute. Well, Jeremiah gets a different command. I command you to not get married. You will remain single and alone. And you are not allowed to go to any social engagements. No parties. How many of you have been to a party in the past month? Or a family gathering of some kind? Any of you been there? Jeremiah's not allowed to go. It's a sad man, but he doesn't quit. And remember, the Lord has touched his lips. He's chosen him for this before he was ever born. And every once in a while, it's not so comfortable. Well, then the Lord says, I want you to move to Jerusalem and preach there, right at the temple gates. And here's what I want you to preach. And that series of, the sermon, of sermons, you know, are all throughout the book of Jeremiah. You, you all know need a Jeremiah magnet to figure out where which of these comes up, but he preaches these sermons against the city and the temple, right at the temple. 
That's where the Lord commands him to do this. And he does it. He's faithful. And he does it with the spirit of the Lord upon him. And a mob forms and wants to kill him. The local authorities intervene and they decide instead to press charges against them for blaspheming the temple and the city. And they have a very public trial at the gate, which was not unusual, and Jeremiah has to defend himself. Peterson, as he describes this particular situation, says it's amazing how a guy who was as emotional as Jeremiah was at this time was so matter of fact. And he looks him in the eye and he says, you know, go ahead, kill me if you want to kill me. But I'm just telling you what the Lord gave me to tell you. And of course, there are the house prophets there, false prophets who are saying, oh, no, 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 that's not what the Lord says. And Jeremiah said, this is the word from the Lord. Kill him. Well, interestingly enough, at this point, the elders come together, and one of those elders says, you know, a hundred years ago, in the time of Hezekiah, who next to David was the most sacred king of Israel and Judah, he says, during that time, Micah, who is still considered one of our prophets, said exactly what Jeremiah is now preaching. Well, Hezekiah didn't put Micah to death, so we probably shouldn't put Jeremiah to death. So they free him. And then the Lord comes up with new instructions. Remember the comedian whose name we're not allowed to mention? Noah and the ark. And he's doing that last bit where he's dragging the hippos up the plank and the bell goes and we hear the voice of the Lord, Noah! And by this time, Noah's response is, what? What do you want now? Well, I can imagine Jeremiah at this point feeling the same way as Noah did in that little comedic skit because the Lord speaks to him again and he says, I want you to go to the potter's house. Well, if we're in Jerusalem, and that's the north part of the city, uh, let's say we're standing at the temple on Mount Moriah. Jerusalem is kind of situated on three major hills. Mount Moriah, where the temple was built by Solomon, and today on that mount, there is an Islamic temple. Underneath it are the foundations of the original temple, uh, part of which extends out to a courtyard uh, where people gather and place notes and prayers into the crevices. It's known as the Wailing Wall. Above that is the Temple Mount, and that's Mount Moriah, where tradition has it uh, Isaac uh, was to be sacrificed by Abraham. Out to the east of us, almost as high, maybe a little bit higher, is another hill called Mount Olivet. That's where Jesus came down on Palm Sunday. On one side was the famous necropolis where all the elite uh, Jews were and still are buried because it is believed that's where the first will be resurrected from the dead. On the other side are olive gardens. Uh, and today, if you were to go there, I never saw an olive tree before until I was there. And it really is quite beautiful, those olive trees and the garden that they form. And uh, of course, that's where Gethsemane was. In between is the Kidron Valley that runs along the eastern side of Jerusalem. Up this way, where the wealthier people live and have houses with upper rooms. It's believed that the upper room where Jesus 
met with his disciples on that Passover night is up there. And what's that mountain called? Anyone know that hill? Zion. That's Mount Zion. Uh, and of course, quite often, Zion is used to describe all of Jerusalem and sometimes all of Israel. Now, to the south, and it all kind of runs downhill. You have the Kidron Valley, which is kind of a ravine that runs down between the two high places here. And then back on the southern end is another valley, the Valley of Hinnom. And if you say Valley of Hinnom in Hebrew or Greek, uh, you get Gehenna. Sound familiar? That's the word that became synonymous with hell. It served many purposes. It was the town garbage dump. There was a cemetery there for people who didn't matter. The worst of criminals, the vagrants, the sick and the lame who didn't have any families, Sometimes they were buried there in a field that became known as the potter's field. And today there are municipalities that have common graveyards uh, for bodies that are not claimed. And many of them still refer to those cemeteries as potter's field. Well, it just so happened that here, where many bodies were just thrown without being buried, and where the fires were always burning them because it was the trash dump as well, that's where the pottery, pottery industry was. Because believe it or not, in that valley, there was a good source of water always flowing down, and there was the right kind of clay for the pottery industry. Well, the Lord says, what? Go out to the potter. And you can imagine Jeremiah saying, I, I, you got to be kidding me. I, I don't want to go there. Oh, something else I forgot to tell you. Not really. I'm just kind of holding it for special dramatic effect. <laughs> it had also become a place of worship that was condemned during the reforms of Josiah, which were really just surface reforms, there was never a transformation. And as soon as Josiah died and his son took over, they resumed again. This is where the child sacrifices were done to the god Moloch. And so we have Judahites who are sacrificing their children to Moloch in Gehenna, right where the pottery industry is. And then they turn around the next day and they're worshiping on the Temple Mount. Where were you last night? Where have you been the last couple of weeks? Did you find yourself during our time of silent confession kind of wishing you weren't surrounded by all your brothers and sisters here as you realized we're all unclean, aren't we? And if some of us are kind of gently proud of the fact that we haven't done any really naughty things, you know where the naughtiest part of our lives are? It's usually in our relationships with each other. On the south side of our lives, we're doing horrible things. On the east side of our lives, here we are on the Temple Mount. 
all the time, we have a gracious God who is slow to anger and quick and generous to forgive. I haven't even read the scripture yet. And the Lord says, go to the potter's house. This is the word that came, chapter 18, verses 1 to 12. Go down to the potter's house, and there I'll give you my message. So I went down, and I saw him working at the wheel, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. Have any of you ever seen a potter work? When uh, Fun in the Sun was a part of the ministry of uh, uh, the... Uh, evangelical renewal group of the uh, church, there was a junior high or middle school Fun in the Sun event called The Great Escape. And one year for the middle school kids, they had a couple come who every morning would speak to the kids. And as the kids would gather, um, it was a husband and wife team and they were potters. And they would sit up there with the clay and the water and the wheel and as they were speaking with the kids, and this is one of the things they would speak about, they would be making an article with the wheel and the clay. <laughs> you can picture the kids because as they're doing this, this beautiful clay item is being formed, and then as they're talking, they suddenly grab it and throw it down and start all over again. You ever feel like God's doing that with you? My response would be good because he is. You're feeling well. That's a good thought. The pot was shaping from the clay, was marred in his hand, so the potter formed it into another pot shaping it as seemed best to him. And then the word of the Lord came to me, and he said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I'll relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. But if at another time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I'll reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Now here's what I say specifically, verse 11, to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. Oh boy. You can imagine Jeremiah bargaining with the Lord. I'd really rather not do this one, Lord. Look, I'm preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways. Some of you who are a little younger remember that song, don't you? How many of you? You've got to turn, baby, yeah. Turn from your evil ways. Each one of you. And reform your ways and your actions. But they'll reply, it's no use. We're going to continue with our own plans. We're all going to follow the stubbornness of our evil hearts. Preach it, Jeremiah. And he did. This time, having failed last time, they decided we won't kill him. We'll run a campaign against him. This is an appropriate time for this text to come up. And oh, these next couple of weeks on our televisions, we're going to see this reenacted over and over. We're just going to go from one to another, like watching a ping pong match. One church in which I served, there was a fellow who worked in audiovisual stuff, and his 
group was hired by politicians on both sides to, to do the, the ads for TV. You know, and he, he would come in and he'd say, it's just amazing, the, the stuff they come up with for these things. And he said, well, you know, we're hired to put it on film, to put it in video and produce it as an ad for TV. Well, they didn't have TVs back then, but oh, word got around. They accused Jeremiah of everything they could think of accusing him of. They did everything they could to strip him of his credibility. It was during these episodes that Jeremiah would eventually say to the Lord at one point, I really want to quit. I don't like this. This is too much for me. And some of you who in your Bible study read the, Peters, the other Peterson book, this is where he got his title, because at this point the Lord said, well, you haven't seen anything yet. If you think this is tough, how do you think you're going to run with the horses? Because now you're just dealing with little stuff. Wait till the big stuff starts coming. So he gave him another assignment. I want you to go get an expensive clay jar and I want you to go out again to the Valley of Hinnom. But before you do, I want you to gather the elders and rulers and priests of the city. And it's very fascinating that Jeremiah had enough contacts that he was able to get that group together. And he takes them out to the valley of Hinnom, carrying his one-foot-high clay pot, very expensive piece of pottery. And they go to the place where the sacrifices were made to Moloch. And they stand over that, and the Lord tells him to take that piece of pottery and to crash it down into the valley. It was the custom in the Middle East that when you broke off a relationship with a friend, that you went to their house with a piece of pottery, a jar of some kind. <laughs> there was no getting around it. People knew where you stood and you stood in front of their house and you took that jar and you crushed it in front of their home to let them know that your relationship with them had been severed. And Jeremiah has to give this message to the leaders of Judah the Lord has had it with you. After the first incident, Jeremiah was really ticked. For one of the few times in the book of Jeremiah, you hear him saying the nastiest things you can find about his own people. Just prior to that, he had been praying on their behalf. Even though he had to preach against them, he was pleading with the Lord to be gracious to them. Now he's saying, get them, Lord, get them. You know those psalms that David wrote, the get them psalms. I like to call them the get them psalms. He has this nice, sweet psalm, and then the last two or three verses is, get them, Lord, get those guys. Get my enemies. Jeremiah's having a little pity angry potter. What he doesn't know and which will be revealed to him soon and he'll get to declare that there is one who is coming who will put those pieces back together again. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. 
I don't have time, but I wish I could tell you about the Dolly Parton song where she talks about that. It's, it's the saddest song that Dolly Parton ever sang, and that's the way it ends. And listening to that song, one day as I was driving my car, I wanted to scream out, we know a king who can do that. And he doesn't need horses and men. He can take the broken pieces of our shattered lives and put them back together again. And he does it at this table. You'll see in your sermon notes that the means of healing is through repentance. And the Lord has established this sacrament as a means of our repentance. If we worship in spirit and truth. And some of us are concerned that Laurie won't know how to turn on the mic when it's her time to read the prayer of thanksgiving. And who's going to serve me after I hand out the bread? And uh, Laurie's probably going to help me do that. Did you know you were going to help me do that? She knows now. <laughs> we're all concerned about that. And that's good that we're concerned because this is the Lord's table. But remember, folks, what the Lord is concerned about is our hearts. Have we come with repentance? And if we have, come and be renewed in his grace. Isn't that good news? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you're the God who knows hearts. And that you won't put up with shattered hearts. That through your blood shed for us, your body given for us, you put our pieces back together. As we anticipate this meal today, Lord, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I have that.